afternoon. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Ali Kujuri. Uh, I'm a, an adjunct uh, faculty at the Department of Engineering Science and uh, one of the organizers of this uh, lecture series. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Sharon, Mr. Sharon Maribani and also Ms. Kate uh, Lapp who helped me in organizing this uh, lecture series. Uh, on behalf of the Department, of Engineering Science and the School of Science and Technology. Let me thank you all and also our uh, uh, guest speaker uh, for attending this, uh, uh, this uh, lecture. This is in fact the fifth lecture uh, for this academic year and uh, believe it or not, 140th lecture in the series since we started in 2006. Before I uh, uh, introduce our guest speaker for today, let me mention that uh, uh, Kate has ordered delicious pizza, it's delicious, I can tell you. Uh, that will arrive at uh, 5.30, right after the talk. And uh, uh, also the next uh, uh, lecture uh, is titled uh, Metal Surfaces Engineering Electromagnetic Wavefronts by uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammed uh, Salem, who is an assistant professor at the uh, engineering department. Our guest speaker for today is Mr. Paul Henry Hernday, and the title of his talk is uh, Fundamentals and Trends of Photovoltaic Electric Generation. Mr. Paul Hernday uh, is performance engineer at uh, Vivint uh, Solar, a na nationwide presidential solar energy company. His work includes using monitoring data from individual solar systems to characterize production, detect performance issues, and provide technical support to the service organizations. Paul is also senior applications engineer at Solmetric, a Sebastopol-based developer and manufacturer of innovative electronic measurement tools for the solar PV industry. At Solmetric, he specializes in PV arrays, array performance measurement, supporting customers uh, through one-to-one -one consulting, training courses, and technical articles. Solmetric is a wholly owned subsidiary of Vivint Solar. Prior to entering the solar field, Paul developed electronic measurement instruments with HP and Agilent Technologies and earned a degree in organization development from Sonoma State University. <laughs> By the way, I should say that this is the second time that uh, we have, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing him. He was here in uh, October 2010 and because his talk was so instructive, I uh, requested I invited him again. So let's give him a hand then. really happy to be here. Um, the, I have a lot of material prepared, and uh, I think given that we're starting a little bit later, I, I may go through some parts of it a little quicker and skip some parts. So um, if, and in fact, uh, what we might do uh, is when I show the uh, topics slide, I'll just take a poll of which topics you're particularly interested in, and then I may skip over the ones that aren't so hot. Um, so um, these are the topics. Uh, an introduction to the two companies that I work for, uh, engineering jobs in solar, uh, how, how solar is, is growing around the world and especially domestically, uh, some, some review of solar cell operation and PV module behavior, how uh, performance of arrays is, is measured, uh, residential PV systems, sort of a photo tour of the different components uh, and diagrams, same thing for utility scale. Uh, very brief touch on concentrating PV systems where you focus the light down and then finally a few slides on managing the grid, uh, making the grid smarter. Um, any particular, you know, using those numbers, are there ones you particularly want to hear about? Number nine. Number nine, okay. Others? That's five. 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 Four also. Four, okay. Two. 
two engineering <laughs> jobs. Yeah, that's not a surprise. Okay, good. And in fact, Katie is also good. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's really hard. You can go, I think. Maybe, I think just do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead and do it because uh, maybe you can uh, stay here longer for another 10 minutes. Okay. For 10 minutes or so. Okay. All right, so a few words about the company that I work for. Vivint Solar is a residential fleet company, meaning that it has uh, residential solar systems in a lot of states in the U.S. Um, some of the hotter states are California, New Jersey, Colorado, New York, surprisingly, uh, uh, the Carolinas and Georgia. Uh, it's qu spreading quite rapidly. And uh, the, the business has several aspects to it. One is a sort of a... a you know, we put the system on your roof, you don't pay anything, but you get less expensive electricity for the life of the system, ranging all the way from that to another model of where you just buy the system. So, uh, and then we have the, a fleet of service trucks, that's one of them that takes care of the system. And then so metric, as Ali mentioned, is a, a, is a ma maker of uh, measurement tools. This is the Solmetric Sun Eye that takes a picture of the sky through a bubble lens and then uh, figures out what's shade, which pixel is shade, and which pixel is open sky. Figures out what that, that the, each pixel is worth in terms of energy during the year. And then gives you a, a summary of the solar access as a, as a, a matter of uh, a season of the year and an hour of the day, in fact, hourly all year long. Um, and then the other main product that we have is, the, is an IV curve tracer. That's the product sitting right here. Here's a technician in complete flash protection suit uh, making connections to the strings of solar panels in a box. That's me holding the computer. And on the screen of the computer, we have the IV curve, which I'll touch on later. It's a current versus voltage curve uh, that gives you a, a complete state of health of the ability of the string of modules to produce power. And the, uh, let, just jump in at any time if you have any questions, OK? So at this point, uh, I want to talk a little bit about engineering jobs. And um, conceptually, the thing I want to stress initially is that there's a huge amount of innovation going on in the solar field right now. It's probably the hottest area of development in the whole country. And the, the innovation uh, is coming in three areas, development of financial tools and resources to finance systems, uh, technological innovations to make things more efficient and less costly, and then design, redesign of the national grid so that we can handle this influx of solar power. Uh, those are really important areas, and innovation is key. These are the, some of the trends in, uh, in the solar electric industry, and I thought it'd be good to mention them because it gives you a, a little bit of feel for where uh, job opportunities might be. So in terms of technology, uh, the development of more efficient, smarter, uh, and lower cost inverters and solar panels uh, is, is really big. Um, the electronics that are going behind the solar panels, uh, th this includes some microinverters, uh, optimizers, which are just ways of taking the DC out of the module and changing it into a DC with different current and voltage to optimize the system, and things like that. And then um, battery storage for residential systems, higher voltages, and on and on, the development of uh, operation and maintenance as an industry. Uh, when solar was first introduced, there was no maintenance. Nobody gave it any thought. And then after a few years, systems started to, to, you know, sort of break down a little bit. A wire would break here or a solar panel would quit. So now that's uh, a pretty robust industry in itself and cooking right along. Um, and then finally, I just want to touch on the grid. There's a lot going on in research for the grid to, to make it more uh, compatible with solar and also to take advantage of solar because you've got all these generators out there on people's houses pumping power into the grid. Well, that could be looked as, at as a resource for when the, the grid voltage becomes uh, sort of squirrely. So if the, grid, if the grid starts to go, you get a brownout, you, the utility could ask all of those inverters to pump more current into the grid at that point. So that, that's another area of research and development. These are uh, kind of the skill sets or job types. Um, I couldn't really separate them, but at Vivint Solar, Solmetric, and the PV industry. And starting with Vivint, um, 
lots of des <coughs> design and production modeling, uh, data science if you're interested in statistics and like math and you're interested in big data, that's a great opportunity right now in the industry. Um, right down through uh, technical management and operation and maintenance. At Sometric, we're more focused on developing products, electrical pro test products. Um, I myself am an, an applications engineer. Um, and, uh, and then in the broader PV industry, outside of these two narrow, narrower uh, views, are all of these different topics. So everything from semiconductors, which is Don Estrich's specialty, uh, through mechanical design of racking, development of advanced batteries, renovating the grid, uh, lots and lots of lots and lots of things, including uh, education, advocacy of uh, solar, uh, and a big one, which I want to stress, is consulting. Even though it's at the bottom of the list, it's uh, it's really important. I've done a lot of that myself through Solmetric, where a customer calls you up and says, "We're having trouble with this array. We don't know why it's behaving badly. Can you come and do some measurements?" Can you look at our measurements and see if we're doing it right? And it's a very satisfying uh, field um, to get into. Um, the, the hottest area there is, is becoming a measurement expert and, uh, and selling your services. You travel, you meet a lot of interesting people. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting field. Do you have any questions about that? I know it's kind of a quick tour of the... Uh, yes. Uh, in the uh, semiconductor technology, which companies are right now doing the research? Well, uh, there are quite a quite a number of solar solar panel companies that are heavily into research, um, it's like Jinko and uh, 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 gosh, there's there's a million uh, companies that are building solar panels. Uh, a lot of them are overseas companies. Yeah, that's what I thought because a lot of the solar panels come from. Yeah. China. Yeah, SunPower is a major one in the U.S. and has always been a leader in, in, uh, in uh, efficiency of their solar panels. And then there are a lot of inverter companies as well. So, so quick, would you also cover storage in that? Generally yeah, that yeah, I'm going to touch on it a little bit later. Yeah. Yeah. And generally that's the battery topic. So this is employment by sector, so the sectors are listed down here. So over the years, you can see that the installation sector has gotten really big as solar has grown. Uh, generally, the whole thing is up to the right. Um, there's a little bit of funny business going on the last couple of years. Part of that is the, in, the uh, inroads that natural gas has made with all the fracking. So as fracking, fracked gas becomes cheaper, uh, it's more and more used for electric generation. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Uh, and then uh, touch on a few of the uh, statistics around solar power. Uh, here we have a, a plot that shows the worldwide growth of photovoltaics. And you notice it's pretty much a, an exponential curve. The last couple of years of data aren't, aren't in yet, but it, it, it's basically on that, on that path. These curves show this, this, uh, the amount of our energy that's coming from uh, the various sources, renewable, nuclear, and whatnot. So petroleum, uh, let's see, where is it? Natural gas is this blue one. And notice how, how much of the resource, how much of the overall genera generation is coming from natural gas now. It really exploded in the last few years. And on the right-hand side, we have a, a picture of the sort of zoomed into the renewables section right here, showing that, uh, that wind is a rapidly growing and important uh, source of renewable energy. Solar is that little bit riding on top of it. So it's not very much yet, but it's growing at a tremendous rate. It's hard to, maybe hard to take that from that picture, but it really, uh, it really is. Why, why has the thing dropped? The, the curve, I mean, are dropping in the... Why has this dropped? I don't know. I, I, I know there's, there's an improvement in efficiency in recent years. Could be that. I'm not sure. Yeah, because, I mean, every, every year now things in the energy consumption. Yeah, more yeah it more. seems like it should be going up. Yeah. Yeah. And th this, um, this shows the, uh, the, the additions each year of new electric generating capacity by, uh, by type of source. 
So uh, here, this, we're seeing the, uh, the natural gas pretty much explode because of fracking. Over here, this dark umber sort of color. And uh, since this is a, a zero to 100% scale, if that grows, then others have to shrink. Uh, so you'll notice that the, uh, that the wind becomes a smaller portion and uh, the solar becomes a smaller portion. That's at, at the expense of, uh, of uh, or uh, as a result of the natural gas increasing. But it's still, still a huge amount of addition each year. And here are some of the forces that are pushing for slower growth or faster growth. And the, this is kind of a clumsy slide, but the way to understand it is it's a, it's a force field diagram, uh, which, which intends to show the forces that are acting toward to cause faster growth and the forces that are opposing that to cause slower growth. And so acting towards faster growth is the widespread concern about the climate the desire for an affordable electricity that doesn't go up every year by 6% or whatever the utilities do, the desire for energy independence, for instance, from the Middle East, um, the, the generation of jobs, which has been very strong, um, the driving forces of innovation, which are making things, you know, amazing things available, and then broader education of the population as to what to expect from solar and what it does. Things that are slowing it down are climate change denial, uh, the lack of a national policy around solar, just as not talked about, um, battles over tariffs and trade, which causes uh, solar panels to be more expensive. Um, we're starting to see a slowdown in the drop of hardware costs, like solar panels and inverters, because you can only push them so far, and then you start to get, you know, you, you cherry pick the, the cost opportunities initially, and then eventually, you, you run out of major opportunities to reduce cost. We're actually seeing a labor shortage in the U.S. in the solar industry and other industries as well. Um, we don't yet have an economical battery storage solution that uh, can be deployed on a large scale, and that's pushing back on solar development at the grid scale, at the, the uh, national grid level. Uh, we have a lot of work to do on our grid in order for it to be uh, truly compatible with rapid development of solar, and there's been some pushback on incentive programs claiming that the incentive programs, for instance, uh, provide too much benefit to wealthy people who have big houses that use a lot of power and don't do enough for, for uh, people on a more limited income. So those are, that's kind of a sense for the, the territory there. Again, if you have any questions or comments, just jump right in. So solar cell and PV uh, performance. This is, uh, this is getting a little closer to my heart. Uh, I love this stuff. And um, uh, so let me, just <laughs> let me just tell you that in case I get really excited, you'll know why. Um, so this is a typical solar cell. It's about five to seven inches on a side. Uh, this is a poly cell, poly, polycrystalline, and you can tell because it has these little different reflecting facets. Um, these, these long, uh, wide bars are, uh, are bus bars that collect the current that is collected by these little fingers, which are called fingers. And uh, these guys are just uh, uh, wired in series up and down a solar panel, just up and down, up and down. And uh, the voltage is developed from front to back side. The back side is metallized. And this is the way uh, a solar cell works. Just as a quick overview, and then I'm going to go into the subcomponents of this, the steps behind it. So we're looking at a cross section of a cell, and the uh, semiconductor has two layers. Uh, one layer has excess electrons, and the other layer has uh, deficiencies of electrons, little places where it's missing an electron. And that's really critical because the result of those two being in contact with another is with one another is an electric field that's quite strong right at the junction between them such that when an incoming photon knocks loose an electron from a, an atom, you have an elect a free electron and you have a hole in an atom. And those things can migrate around. And if the electron uh, originating on this side gets close to this electric field, it gets swept across and it can't go back. So it winds up going through the external circuit. Same thing if a hole gets generated up here, it winds up shooting that way and getting uh, going, going south. So there are two processes here, charge generation, which is caused by the photon coming in, and 
charge collection, which is the separation of the charges so that they can flow through the external circuit. And it takes uh, about 10,000 years for a, for a photon to be generated and, and migrate from the middle of the sun to the outer edge of the sun. It takes eight minutes for the photon to get to the U.S., so we don't want to waste any of them. <laughs> it wouldn't be polite. <laughs> so, uh, so the whole thing about solar cells is to try to increase the likelihood that any photon coming in is actually going to separate these two and that they're actually going to get collected and driven through the external circuit. What tends to happen with some of them is that they recombine before they get out of this region. Um, and, uh, and then that's, that energy is lost. So let's look at the semiconductors that make it up. Uh, there, as I mentioned, it's a sandwich between two semiconductor layers. And the, in one, one of the layers, you have uh, phosphorus uh, doping. So every once in a while, a sil silicon atom is replaced by phosphorus. And you've probably talked about this in semiconductor courses, right, with doping. So it's totally transportable. The same thing. A, a solar cell is just a big diode. And uh, so you have, you have this photon, uh, this phosphorus atom that contributes an extra electron. It's just got an extra electron in its outer shell. And in the, in the matrix of a silicon, uh, uh, in a silicon crystal, that is basically a free electron. It can float around even at room temperature. And then the other part of the sandwich is the p-type semiconductor that has um, an extra, or has a, a missing electron in the, in the outer shell of four. And so that acts as a positive charge, and it turns out that that can migrate around as well. And the next uh, thing here is really hokey, but I, I think it's really useful. Uh, it's an analogy that explains the movement of a hole through a semiconductor. So the, the, the absence of an electron in that outer shell is called a hole, and it's a, treated, as, treated as a positive charge, as you probably know. So what I have here is an egg carton, or an egg flat, and it's full of eggs, and we're going to use this to demonstrate how a hole moves. So the carton is the silicon crystal, the eggs are electrons, the lack of an egg is a hole, and what I'm going to do is going to shake the carton so that, the, so that the eggs are bouncing up and down and have a chance to move sideways. And we'll see what happens. So first I remove, a, I remove an electron so that I create a hole. That's the hole we're going to migrate, watch migrate around. And as we shake the tray, the hole, an egg suddenly leaps from next door into that hole, creating another hole, and so on and allowing the hole to migrate across the crystal. So that's the way the holes move. <clears throat> and then another process going on, and this again is right out of your semiconductor training, uh, is the diffusion of, of uh, electrons and holes across the boundary, across the junction. So um, a hole, just like a room, a, 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 like suppose this is a room and there's a person smoking over here and there's a person over here with really strong aftershave on or something. And if you're over here, you smell smoke. If you're over here, you smell aftershave. But after a while, the whole room smells like smoke and aftershave. So it's the same concept. Uh, a hole is going to migrate or diffuse across here into a lower density region of holes and going to leave a bound negative charge here. And an electron is going to diffuse into this region where there are fewer electrons and it's going to leave a bound positive charge there that's stuck in the crystal. It's, it's, it's the atom itself. So they can't move. And as a result, you have this depletion region where there's, there's no free charge right around the junction. And that uh, sets up the electric field. Um, you have these fixed bound charges that creates this electric field. And now you've got, now you've really got something. This, this can do work. And uh, the beauty of it is there are no moving parts in it, uh, you know, as, as with all semiconductors. Uh, once, once you have this and put some contacts on it, you can generate electricity for 20, 30 years. It's really beautiful. So completing the circuit, we put some metal contacts on it and uh, an external wire and a load, which, you know, would be a light bulb in this case or an inverter in a real system. And, uh, and then uh, you generate your pairs of charges, and when one of them gets to the boundary, it zings across there, flows, the electrons flow through the outer circuit, and when they come in to back into the crystal again, 
they annihilate a hole. The next time a hole comes in, it annihilates that hole. So uh, someone asked earlier, what's the state of uh, efficiency of PV cells? And uh, so this is just cell efficiencies, not modules. Module is the whole group of cells, solar panel. And uh, so it depends. Um, over here, we have efficiencies running from 10% to 44%. And the, 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 the ones that are most common in the industry are in the, the teens to, to the low 20s right in here. And those are crystalline solar panels. or or single crystal, poly or crystal, poly, multi-crystalline or single crystalline. And way up here we have the uh, multiple junction semiconductors, which uh, are, are achieving efficiencies as high as 45%. Pretty amazing, but very expensive. Sure. So, uh, and another thing that this implies, this the picture implies, is the tremendous amount of research that's going on around the, around the world on this. Uh, lots of labs in, in Asia and in, in Europe and the U.S. Australia is a major leader in it. So, it's really cool. The other thing about solar panels that I'd like to mention is how they're wired internally. So. Um, the, the typical solar panel has three groups of solar cells wired in series. So the current comes in here from the previous solar panel, flows down, back up, down the next U-shaped circuit, and then the final U-shaped circuit, and then leaves and goes to the next solar panel. And um, so that's, that's great. If it, were, if it weren't for things like shade, we'd never have to do anything differently. Sorry. Um, Hopefully this doesn't do eye damage. <laughs> but um, the extra bit that is more subtle in solar panels are these, these bypass diodes. So their purpose is to protect any cell that gets shaded from being destroyed by the energy of all the other cells. So in the second drawing here where we put some shade over one of the cells, it causes that bypass diode to, to go into forward conduction. And all of the current from the other uh, cells and the other modules before it flows through that bypass diode instead of going through the damaged cell or the, the uh, shaded cell. Because if it weren't for that, all the voltage of the other cells in the system would force that, that uh, shaded cell into reverse bias. Uh, so it might go to minus 60 volts, for instance, and uh, with six or eight amps flowing through it, that's an enormous amount of power. So it would just burn that whole part of the, uh, the cell. And uh, I wanted to mention that I'm going to leave this here. This is a model of uh, how a solar panel and bypass diodes work. These are the three cell groups. Um, and these meters monitor the amount of current flowing through the cell group compared with the amount of current flowing through this big fat bypass diode that's mounted right, right across it. And if you put this out in the sun and put a short circuit across it so that it's a current generating loop, and you'll notice that all of the, um, the cell meters are conducting the same amount of current, and there's no current through any of the bypass diodes. But if you put your hand partly over a cell, you'll start to see the bypass diode <coughs> current increase. And uh, if you cover several of them, that'll, you know, it'll all be going through the bypass diode. <clears throat> Let's take a look at uh, measurement of array performance. This is one of the things that we do at Solmetric. And um, this, is a, this is kind of a laboratory way or introductory way to get familiar with the IV curve. You take a, an adjustable resistive load and uh, um, connect it across a solar panel, a small solar panel, and then measure the voltage across the panel and the current coming out of it as you adjust that load. And you take a bunch of points and plot them on a current versus voltage axis. And lo and behold, you have an IV curve. Um, and the, the IV curve has a maximum power point, which is, you can imagine that the contours of, of constant power would look something like this. High voltage, low, high, high current, low voltage, moving like this to high voltage, low current. 
And so one of those contours touches the knee of this curve, and that's why this is the maximum power point. But of course, that's not done. It's not done that way in the industry because um, it's too slow. So this is the um, this is the symmetric IV curve tracer, the, so the the polarization analyzer, and it's run. This is an old slide. It's run now by a tablet, um, and it uses Wi-Fi to talk to the two instruments. This instrument is the curve tracer, and this instrument measures the amount of irradiance or solar power that's coming down at the moment as well as the temperature with a plug-in thermocouple, uh, the temperature of the module, and the tilt of the module. And all of that data uh, goes, goes into a model that predicts what the, what the performance should be at the moment of the measurement, and that's represented by the three dots. So the, this dot is the expected short circuit current, this is the expected open circuit voltage, and this is the expected max power point. So if the curve goes through that, that dot, uh, everything is sweet. If it's anywhere to the lower left of that, something is either wrong or the, the module is aging, the cells are aging, or maybe the model parameters aren't quite right. A lot of reasons, potential reasons for it. Did you have a question? Yeah, so on this graph, are you actually measuring the current, or not the current, I'm saying, the time, the voltage through it currently, or is this just the model that you guys are coming up with? Uh, yeah, good question. So this solid curve is, is, is measured, and the way we do that is by, in this box, this is about half capacitors, big, high-quality electrolytic capacitors all wired in parallel. And when you, when you click measure now, it drops that capacitor bank across the PV source <coughs> circuit, and the initial current is, is a short circuit current because there's no voltage on the capacitors. And then as the capacitors quickly fill up, we wind up tracing out this curve. And when we reach the open circuit voltage of the, uh, of the, the cir PV circuit, and there's no more current. And that, that, it takes about a quarter of a second to go through that zero to two open circuit voltage. And then for comparison purposes, we, we generate with the model those three dots, so you have some feedback as to whether it's working right. And uh, the reason that the IV curves are so useful is that there are all kinds of deviations that you can detect in an IV curve that are really important. For instance, there may be steps in the IV curve, which can be a sign of shading issues or uh, aging differentials between different uh, modules, cracked modules, lots of things like that, uh, shorted bypass diodes, uh, just to take one example. Uh, aging cells may have produced less current or less voltage, number three, and, uh, and, and so on. So it's a, a really important measurement and almost all major solar companies now, developers of solar plants, insist on, solar, on measuring the performance with IV curve tracers. And a lot of them specifically require that they use the symmetric box to do it. So Paul, are you disconnecting it or is it running live? Um, yeah, good, good question. So, uh, let's see, I think, do I have a picture of that? I think I have a picture later, but, but basically when you, when you do this measurement, um, these, these test leads are connected directly to the, the source circuit, which could be a PV module or it could be a string of modules all connected together, or even a few strings in parallel, to up to the current limit of 30 amps. And there are a couple of practices that you use when you do that, like you shut down the inverter and you open up the big DC disconnect switch at the combiner box where you're making this measurement so that you, you know you're not connected to the rest of the PV system at the same time. This is a wall chart <coughs> with, with diagnostic techniques that uh, follow on these six different uh, types of deviation from the IV curve. Depending upon which deviation you have, you branch off into these different directions for diagnostic purposes. And this is an example of the things that applications and engineers do to help customers with uh, work aids. Another technique for, uh, for diagnosing uh, problems in PV arrays is infrared imaging, infrared camera. In this case, uh, we're looking at the top half of the solar panel where um, 
where this um, the central two columns has been shaded by a piece of cardboard that you can't see right here, forcing the bypass diode to turn on and conduct the current from this group around this group and into this group. Because of this group now is not exporting any, any electricity, it's not getting that air conditioning effect of exporting power, so it's running a little bit hotter. And uh, that's a really powerful tool for identifying chunks of the array that are not performing well. This is done by uh, the same technique, but it's from a, a helicopter. Uh, and this is a one megawatt system, almost one megawatt. Each one of these tiny squares is a solar panel. And you see these, these two stripes here. Uh, I was there to service this uh, when we were first introducing the product up in Oregon. And uh, we walked across this array and serviced those two strings. And it turns out two, connect, two solar um, two PV connectors between, between modules had burned up, just burned up and dropped on the ceiling or the roof, uh, opening up those two strings. So that's why they were running a little bit hotter than the others. Is it difficult to access the panels when they're in the middle like that? Yeah, you don't want to walk on them because you can crack the cells. Uh, so in this case, we walked on, uh, they were supported by beams underneath right along the edges of the frame. So we had to very carefully like walk along that place where they were sitting on the frame. So let's take a look at residential systems and some of the components. Of course, there's the rooftop array. And these are the components diagrammatically or sketchy-wise. The solar panels, the inverter that converts a DC to AC. And then you have your customer's load panel on the side of the house and the meter. The energy flows either to the utility or into the house loads, uh, depending upon what your loads are. Um, the question always comes up as to how the how the energy knows which way to go. And so, if you if you um, turn on a load here, basically you're 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 pulling down the voltage at this point, and the current's going to come from here to replace that or to to fill that need, rather than coming through this higher resistance path from the utility. Now, uh, Neil, in, ans in, in answer to your question, this is a, a typical uh, inverter spr string, uh, string inverter diagram where this is the conventional original type of solar panel system that we had where all the solar panels in a string are connected in a series and they, they come back through fuses to a combiner and then they're converted from AC to DC and out to the utility. So if we were using an IV curve tracer on this, what we would do is remove all these fuses clip the instrument into the two, two big bus bars here, and then uh, put one fuse back in to determine you know, if we want to measure that string. So that would complete the circuit through that one string into the IV curve tracer, and then after getting that measurement, we would just move up to the next fuse. So that's the conventional string system. That's a conventional type of inverter, and right next to it is, uh, is it, uh, is a uh, AC disconnect switch, so you can disconnect it from the utility. The other way of doing a residential system is to put electronics behind the panels. And so this is a construction of a system on a house where the rails are in place, the racking, and the next step was to mount these microinverters. One, one is, uh, a panel is gonna go over each one of these, a solar module, and the solar module is gonna plug into these two PV connectors right here. And this is, this is really, really important because it, uh, it allows each module to function independent of the others. If you have shading uh, on one module, it doesn't affect the others, and so on. Here's a picture of servicing a uh, system that has microinverters, and you can see the, the microinverter right down here attached to the panel. This is a, the wall equipment for a microinverter type system, just a, an AC combiner box uh, and the, the, the AC disconnect and the monitoring box. And then we have battery storage, which is starting to come on with uh, residential systems. The value of, uh, of battery storage is that um, you can, you can uh, tuck away some energy during the day and use it in the evening, um, or you can 
in some of some systems you can charge the battery at night when energy is cheaper and use it during the day when you have a, a peak load and energy costs are higher. Okay, excuse me, what's the output of these batteries? Oh boy, there, there are tech, there's so many different technologies competing now in, in the battery field for PV. Some of them are called AC batteries, where they just put out 110 volts, or 220 or 240 volts. Um, and some of them put out DC at ranging from 48 volts to the same voltage that a PV string would put out. And then finally, I just wanted to mention that there are, are really advanced uh, tools for designing PV systems now, including the, the Solmetric. Um, uh, PV designer uh, software where you, you lay out your panels on the rooftop, which can be any shape. Uh, you describe the, the types of modules and the, the types of inverters that are used. Um, and you generate an a hourly and monthly production curve. And then you can, you can clone that. This is one design. You clone that and make a few changes. And then you can compare those two designs as we're doing here. The, the, the gray and the orange bars are two different designs, slightly different designs. So this is a great way for a, a student or an entry-level designer to get familiar with the trade-offs in, in doing a PV system design. And if any of you are interested in this, we can set you up with the software. Utility scale systems. Here's a typical utility plant. Uh, these, are, these are not solar panels. These are rows of solar panels. This might be two strings long, and it might be two strings wide. So this might be four strings of 10 or 20 solar panels. They get, they get fairly big. One of them I visited, and I just thought, how big is this? I couldn't really relate to it. So I took my rental car, and I accelerated to 60 miles an hour. And then I took my foot off the gas and coasted to the other end. And it was about the same. <laughs> That's about how big it was. It was pretty big like more than a quarter mile easily. And the, the, uh, the hot thing in utilities is to uh, track the sun. And the most common way to do that is to mount the solar panels on north-south tubes. These are square torque tubes. And drive it with a, a, a worm gear so that they start by facing east in the morning and then gradually move to west in the afternoon. This is... Uh, greatly improves the, the yield. Uh, and there are a number of different mechanisms for doing this. If you're interested in mechanical engineering, this is, this is a really fun, fun thing. You notice they all have a, some way of generating a, a tilt. Uh, and these are especially common in the, in the Southwest. Here we show um, the advantages of tracking. So here's a fixed array, the red curve. And you notice it has the expected bell-shaped curve that peaks at solar noon. And the shoulders are, there are, there are no shoulders. Whereas if you go with a single axis tracker, that's the green curve, and it has some really nice shoulders. And if you take another axis, into, into the, you know, add another axis so that it can follow the sun exactly no matter where it is in the sky, then your production just jumps up basically at, uh, at sunrise or shortly after, and is almost flat all the way till almost sunset. So those, those, are, uh, those, those are important shoulders there. They're worth a lot of money. How much power is used to, to turn them now? Is, is to turn them? Oh, it's, it's, it's really minor. It's just a little electric motor that can move a whole quarter acre of solar panels all at once. I, I, I am a little more concerned about the amount of uh, metal and refinement and stuff that goes into solar systems, but I'm I've asked enough people who know about that to, to feel reassured that it, over the life of the system, it, it rapidly repays uh, all of the aluminum and the steel that went into it. More and more common is to, on big systems, is to have the, uh, sub, the builders of the inverters just package them ahead of time, and you just drop them in place and wire them up. Here's a schematic of a, a, a utility scale system. Uh, commonly, they'll be done with a concrete pad, the inverter and the PV array, and um, a transformer, a big AC transformer on each pad. You just put them in series and connect, connect them up to one of these, which is a, is a PV utility substation, and Bob's your uncle. 
Now, one, uh, one of the things that's a concern in utility scale systems, especially in the California Central Valley, is dirt. And uh, if you've ever lived in the Central Valley, you know what, that, what that's all about. Uh, I was asked to come down to this Bakersfield system and help them understand what the impact of this dirt was. So what we did is uh, took the IV curve tracer and measured uh, several dirty strings, and then they were using an experimental panel washer. So they went back and forth and washed those panels, and uh, sure enough, it explained exactly the amount of loss that they had seen in the last 27 days since the last time they cleaned it. So that, you know, 22%, well, what's 22%? Well, business-wise, that's, that's a huge amount, and they had not scheduled enough for cleaning the, the solar cells. Finally, a few, uh, a few slides on uh, dual axis trackers. I mentioned that earlier, the kind that can actually follow the sun all day long. And they have some depth to them. You can see they're kind of thick, and that's because they have optics built into each of the cells. This is like six or seven cells high and four or five wide. Um, and <clears throat> they, um, they either work on the basis of a Fresnel lens or an actual optical lens to concentrate the light. So if this is six inches, this winds up being maybe an inch or, or less. That's the solar cell. And the solar cell is typically, in these systems, is typically built up of, uh, of two or three layers of uh, a solar cell, where each layer is sensitive to a different wavelength or frequency of light. And that, uh, that allows for less wastage and higher efficiency. So in this case, these three layers correspond to these three colors here in the uh, spectral diagram. diagram. And these are very expensive to make relative to regular solar cells, which is, uh, is why they are only used in these concentrating systems, because the concentrators themselves are expensive and the big tracker is expensive. So you match them together, and the 40% efficiency of this cell helps defray the cost of all the rest of it. Where's visible? Yeah, where? I think uh, visible is somewhere around uh, 400 to 900, something oh, like that. We're way saying. down here. Yeah. And then finally, these are the last few slides. I'm managing the grid. I just wanted to add a little bit of this because uh, it's an interesting career opportunity uh, to work for a major grid operator. Um, what? What this sinusoidal curve represents is, is daily variation of load uh, on the grid. And so what, what the forecasters and schedulers of, of uh, production and, and loads and whatnot need to worry about is are they going to have enough energy for the next several days? Um, are they going to be able to manage the load variations in the next hour or two? Uh, and also, how are they going to manage uh, variations that are on the scale of a minute or less. Those are all big deals. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the ways that's, that solar can help, even residential solar, is by injecting um, energy, more energy into the grid when the voltage is low and a little bit less if the voltage peaks and goes high. So that can help with this really fast regulation of the grid voltage. And it can also help uh, this as well. Another interesting topic is uh, aggregating uh, renewable energy sources in order to reduce the intermittency. So uh, if you look at a single house or a single utility uh, PV system, you're going to have on a cl partly cloudy day this kind of thing going on, which, you know, if that were the sole power source for an industry or a company, it wouldn't work. But if you, if you combine the uh, production from several different solar systems that are located in different weather zones, then you wind up with a, the study shows you can wind up with a really nice smooth curve. So that's the, that's the holy grail, and that's one of the reasons that the grid needs to be renovated so that we can switch these renewable power sources in, into aggregation and uh, smooth out their, their, their contributions. The same thing can be done between different renewable sources, like between wind and solar. So in some areas of the country, uh, the, the, the wind energy uh, actually increases in the, in the morning hours and the evening hours, which perfectly complements the solar energy curve. 
so as a result, you can get a, a much more level uh, source, of, source of energy. I'm going to skip that one. This is pretty cool. This, for, for utilities, um, I'll start with this slide. This is, a, this is the storage tank for electrolytes for a utility scale uh, flow battery. So you, know, you can imagine these are like 10,000 gallon tanks. Each one is filled. These guys are filled with a positive electrolyte. These guys are filled with a negative electrolyte, I assume. And, um, and that electrolyte is going to flow through a, uh, a cell, a battery cell. So picture this as your, your ever-ready battery or your dual, dual, dual uh, what's it, dual cell? Duracell. Duracell. Um, so you have two different electrolytes, and the, the way the electrolytes interact with each other is where you get your energy. And when the electrolytes are depleted, the battery is dead. Well, in the case of a flow battery, the, ele the electrolyte is constantly being uh, replenished by, from these vats, from these tanks. And so they have the capability of, of producing power as long as you have fresh electrolyte, which can be huge vats, and, uh, and they, can, they can produce uh, a level of power, uh, let's say kilowatts, um, depending upon, that can vary depending upon how fast you can pump the electrolyte through. So if you, if you have to put out big pulses of, of power, uh, you want to pump faster. If you want to uh, provide lower energy for a longer period of time, then you can afford to pump slower. So these are really important, but they're really expensive. In a way, it's sort of like fuel cells. That's, uh, there's a lot of technology that to be developed to do it efficiently and cost effectively. So that's it. And we have uh, minus 30 seconds for questions. <laughs> yes? Yeah, there's a couple solutions. One is the tractor-mounted arm, like I showed. Another one is, uh, is robotics, that a robot that crawls along the panels and has brushes. Uh, in some of them, they actually recover the water, uh, filter it, and reuse it. So it's, it's much less demanding on local water resources. But it's a, it's a huge problem. It, it, in, in some parts of the world, hand cleaning them or with brushes might be practical, but not in the US. So I think robotics is, is, is the main thing. What about for residential? Uh, do they need the same upkeep as well? Is there a lack of upkeep? Yeah, so in most parts of the country, um, in most parts of the country, the, the occasional rain will clean, clean them off. Mm -hmm. That's certainly true on the East Coast. In the Central Valley, we have the same problems that I showed here mm -hmm. uh, with residential. And another thing that can happen with uh, PV systems is that if you have just a little bit of rain every once in a while, what it tends to do is migrate the dust down towards the bottom edge of the module where it stacks up against a little aluminum frame edge and starts to work its way up, <coughs> covering the lower row of cells uh, very incrementally and gradually with time. And so that tends to reduce the, uh, the output of the solar panel. Price of say a sun power module uh, at 20 or 24 percent versus uh, an 18 or 16 percent ordinary module, um, they definitely command a premium. There's no doubt about it. I would imagine they're, you know, they're a bit more. Uh, but especially since this is recording, I'm I'm not going to even take a stab at it. Uh, but. The, the benefit of the high efficiency is that you can put more panels, more you get more generation in a limited amount of roof, roof space. So if you're interested in you know, running an electric car or you have a lot of home loads and you have a limited amount of roof space, or if it's ground mount, limited amount of yard space, then going with uh, high efficiency panels is the way to go. Could you say, say a little bit about that demand amount of flow that they could generate, that that would give the maximum. Yes. So there would only really be some way of reducing the load should the network through them. 
It's just you mentioned that they could increase the amount of power. Right. And so just speak about that. What, what sure. I'm going to go back to the IV curve. But just if, if, if I knew that my one of my house wasn't generated its maximum, I, I'd be questioning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm losing capacity. Yeah. You know. <laughs> right, right. So, um, so I, I think that, I, I think I agree with you that, uh, in general, you want your well, obviously, you want your house to be generating power right at the maximum power point, so you can get all the benefit you can from it. Uh, in some cases, the utilities will, will require, um, at least in the future, may require certain solar resources to be curtailed a little bit, to back off. And what when you want to back off on production, what you do is you take the operating point and move it from the uh, from the maximum power point a little bit lower in voltage or a little, or sorry a little bit higher or a little bit lower in voltage either one will reduce the amount of output power if it's in a curtailed spot then you could uncurtail it to to increase the amount of energy support that you give the grid but another another important benefit of uh, of solar is not just in voltage stability, but in power quality. So there's a there's a power quality parameter called uh, power factor. Are you familiar with power factor? Uh, power factor in in AC circuits is where the uh, or at least power circuits is where the uh, current gets out of phase with the with the voltage. So if you have a generator operating strictly into a resistive load, they're going to be in phase, and the power factor is going to be 1.0. But if it's oper if you're, if you're supplying power to it like a, a, a big, uh, highly mechanized indus industrial plant that has a lot of motors, you'll sometimes see a pole outside those factories with a whole bunch of capacitors on it. And that's to adjust the, the, the power factor because the, all the loads are inductive, so you have to put some, some capacitance in parallel to make the power factor come back to one. So in the future, when uh, utilities are able to speak electronically to the individual inverters on your house, they'll be able to say, oh, I need you to go to a, a more inductive power factor or a more capacitive power factor, and that'll help stabilize the grid. And they'll, all be, they'll also be able to have the grid help with the frequency modulation, the frequency control to keep it closer to 60 hertz. Other questions? Yeah. I was wondering about this uh, PV design tool that you mentioned. Uh -huh. Does it also have the, it probably does, that exact location of where you are simulating that power? Yes. So that it uses make... the latitude and longitude. Uh, it has the local weather, uh, historical local weather, so that it knows uh, how much uh, solar resource is available each hour of the year. It takes all of that into account. It's pretty cool.